Humanitarian groups warn the fighting in the Democratic Republic of Congo is about to explode. The UN accuses Rwanda of backing rebels. What's behind the latest flare-up in the conflict? And could it spark another regional war? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Sami Zaydan. Congolese rebels known as M23 say they have no plan to attack the main city of Goma in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. But M23 have been fighting the Congolese army in the east of the country for weeks now. The army appears to be struggling to contain the fighters. On Thursday, Rwanda and Congo agreed on a plan to eradicate armed groups. But a UN report says Rwanda is actually supporting the M23 with arms and recruits. Well, the conflict has been raising tensions between the two countries. And the UN also says the rebellion has displaced more than 100,000 civilians. Well, history appears to be repeating itself in the DRC. For almost two decades, ethnic rivalries have led to fighting across the eastern border. Let's take you back to 1994. That's when conflict began in Rwanda, leading to the genocide of mostly Tutsis. By June 1994, the Tutsis took power in Rwanda and the Hutus fled across the border to the DRC. Well, now in the DRC, Laurent Kabila comes to power in 1997, backed by Rwanda. But Kabila loses Rwanda's support in 1998, sparking five years of regional conflict. The war ends in 2003. Rwanda and the DRC sign a peace deal six years later, and Congolese Tutsi rebels are integrated into the army. But in March of this year, the Congolese Tutsi fighters now called the M23 mutiny. The DRC says they're getting support from the Tutsi-led Rwandan government. So what's triggered the latest fighting in the DRC? Well, to answer the question, we're joined now by our guests in London, Ambassador Barnaby Kikaya bin Karubi. He's the ambassador of the Democratic Republic of Congo to the UK. In Brussels, we have Chris Berwoutz, a Congo analyst who specializes in peace and security building in Central Africa. And in Washington, D.C., Yusuf Bunvigie, lawyer and member of the Congo Global Coalition. And also joining us on the line is Ambassador James Kimonio, the Rwandan ambassador to the United States. Welcome to all of you, gentlemen. If I could start with uh, our ambassador of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or all of this fighting, of course, and problems are taking place. From the official perspective of your government, what's to blame? What's flared up this problem? Well, immediately after the elections, the president received a visit by two high-ranking officials from the international community, that the Belgian Minister of Foreign Affairs and the British Minister for International Development, Mr. Andrew Mitchell. Both officials put the pressure on the president to hand over to The Hague, to the ICC in The Hague, Mr. Boscon Taganda, who was at the time in the National Army. He was in the army following uh, the agreement that we signed with the CNDP rebel movement on March, in March 2009. Um, but the international community wanted him in The Hague, where Tomal Lubang has just been uh, indicted and condemned. Now, when we moved to arrest him, of course, he mutinied from the National Army and starting a new rebellion that we know today as the M23 movement. That's what started the whole chaos that we see in Eastern Congo today. It's because we wanted to arrest a war criminal, internationally known, a person who was wanted by the International Criminal Court. Why are you finding it so difficult to arrest him, and why is it taking so long? I mean, even now, he's reported only to have maybe two or three hundred uh, soldiers on his side. Well, um, for the time being, we're finding it difficult to arrest him because he has been supplied with new weaponry, and his troops have increased. As you know, from the peace agreement that we signed in March, 2009, 
he was elevated to the rank of general and he integrated our national army. Supplied with new weaponry by who, sir? Well, new weaponry from the Republic of Rwanda. The Republic of Rwanda has been supplying him not only with weapons, but with ammunition and fresh troops. This is not us talking. This has been documented and proven beyond any doubt oh, by right. the United Nations, a United Nations group of experts, and as well as international NGOs operating in the area. All right, let me bring in Ambassador James uh, Kiminiono into this discussion. Uh, I, I take it you probably disagree with that analysis. Are you supplying um, uh, rebels in the eastern part of the DRC? Sometimes we find it difficult to even uh, engage ourselves in that kind of a discussion because uh, those are Congolese uh, <coughs> internal matters, and, and I don't think... Uh, I have so much to say, but but. Uh, but you, I mean, in the past historically, you have had troops in the Congo, uh, Democratic Republic yes. of Congo. It's uh, not entirely uh, a matter which doesn't concern you. I, I think I have to respond to the question that, that mm -hmm. uh, the ambassador raised. Uh, it, 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 this is uh, the position that everybody knows that the government of Rwanda has totally rejected any accusation or involvement in terms of supporting. The rebels in the Congo, and that's our stand, and, and whatever is, is brought to to, to, to the, the media in the form of accusations is, is just based on the falsehood, and, and nobody has been able to, to prove what's being said. All right, let's bring in Chris Wouts. You're a Congo analyst. I understand you've been doing research, some of which has been uh, used by the United Nations. Tell us a little bit about the evidence as the ambassador said no one has got the evidence is there any evidence what does it say well it's not the first time that uh, Rwanda is denying the conclusions and the recommendations of the um, expert panel of the United Nations and eh? that's uh, it's almost a pattern for the last for the last couple of years for the last well decade even um, but but apart from from the Congolese sources on, on the involvement of Rwanda uh, there are um, uh, there's that international um, committee, that an international expert panel, which has a, a good reputation. Um, so at this point, there seems no doubt that uh, r um, that support is coming from Rwanda. What is maybe more difficult is to identify who exactly and and especially why in Rwanda uh, they are supporting the the mutiny. But uh, it it happens. All right, let me take the question back to uh, Ambassador Kimonio. I mean, the UN report alleged that Rwandan government representatives on one occasion, just to give an example, told the mutineers in a meeting that their goal in supporting the rebellion, which is what we're talking about right now, was the secession of two Congolese provinces on the border, uh, the Kivus. And they are, of course, as I'm sure you know, mineral rich. I mean, why is the UN coming up with stuff like that um, if it's not true? I think what is most important, even for your audience, is to really uh, explain uh, to what point uh, do the accusations become a fact and someone is found guilty. Because I don't think this, this conversation will take us anywhere where, in a situation whereby someone says you are accused of doing something, supplying weapons and, and, and so on and so forth, and on the other hand, I'm saying you have to prove it. We have not reached that point. And here we are, we are telling the audience that this is what, what Rwanda is doing. And I don't think we can reach any conclusion because it's not a question of, 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 of blaming Rwanda and, 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 and people will, will simply believe that because those are the accusations that are laid against Rwanda, people should believe it. That, that's the, the problem that even the media has. Because right. That, that's a very good. That's a very good point, and therefore, building on that, I'm asking you: Why do you think that if it's the media, if it's the UN, uh, this case is being presented in this way? Why is the UN making these allegations? And, and I don't think it's, this is a, a UN allegation or anything. It's just uh, the group of experts who went to the region. They have done these reports in the past. They come up with uh, their findings, and the, the findings are normally presented to the people who are accused. Unfortunately, in our case, the findings were not presented to us adequately to be able to, to look into those accusations. And that's the reason why even the, the, the group is going back to Rwanda to actually 
you know, uh, look into those things before we even reach any conclusion. So I'm wondering why even these media organizations are taking it as a, as a final a kind of a report when it, we still uh, have a long way to go in terms of looking into some of the, some of the allegations that are raised against Iran. Okay, and uh, perhaps we'll, uh, we'll come back to some of those points later. I want to bring in, though, into the discussion at this point, Yusuf Bunvigier, and let's talk a little bit about wh while, the, you know, the ambassador yeah. made a good point. Everyone is focused on Rwanda. Is Rwanda involved? I'm, I'm is here. Rwanda uh, supplying weapons? But there is also a question, isn't there, as to whether there is a failure on the part of the, the government of the DRC in terms of integration, reaching out to people, is there not? Well, I, I, think, I think we need to, to have some uh, kind of set of facts which will give us uh, an insight on uh, what is the Democratic Republic of Congo as how we know it. And uh, I'll take my attention to basically what you've been arguing about, the international community and uh, a group of NGOs which have been very, very lenient on the government in Kinshasa because as far as Congolese are concerned, the government in Kinshasa has some deep responsibility not only to the people but also to, the, to its own uh, constitutional. In the constitution there is an issue of decentralization. That issue of decentralization is an issue which is supposed to bring service to the people. And when you bring service to the people, you are going to be more efficient in handling any matter. Security, uh, you know, you, ca you can handle any, even social, social issues in the country. Now, let's go back to the agreement which the government took with the CNDP Pareko. This agreement has never been fulfilled. Yes, the, go the government did give a chance for some soldiers to, to be elevated to high ranks, but they, didn't, they did not go down to the root, root cause of the conflict, which is a lot of instability and uh, tension among various tribes and ethnic groups in the Kivu region. The government should have initiated a process of reconciling the people. But instead of doing that, and that can, can only be done through a clear process of decentralization, empowering okay. the people at the grassroots. All right, let's take uh, your thought there back to Ambassador uh, Barnaby. Uh, would, would you accept any responsibility? Would your government accept any responsibility for the problems that exist uh, in the eastern part of your country uh, due to mismanagement? Not at all. Um, I've heard somebody say that uh, the agreement of March 2009 was not fulfilled by the government of Congo. Honestly, uh, Mr. Bosco Taganda was elevated to the rank of general. Mr. Sultani Makenga is a colonel. As we speak, we've got CNDP people in the central government. The provincial government of North Kivu has got CNDP people in there. Just to so explain and simplify for our audience, CNDP are, of course, uh, the uh, uh, Tutsi, uh, DRC Tutsi rebels who were integrated into your government, is what you're saying. Exactly. And w when, when the army was integrated, because uh, I've heard people now mention how we manage the, decent the decentralization of our country, really, I would laugh at it if the situation was not so, um, so serious. Um, that's an internal matter to the Congo, but I haven't heard, no, I haven't heard none of your uh, people, people who have spoken after me, mention the problem of Bosco Taganda, because that's where it all started. Mr. Mr. Bosco Taganda is wanted in The Hague, and Mr. Bosco Taganda, when we integrated the army, he is the one who was commanding troops when he was still in the army, all along the line in North and South Kivu. Now today, he mutinied from the army and uh, even all the localities that he says he's taking. No, he is the one who has been there all along. Now, why, let, why, why don't we focus on that question? Because Bosco Taganda is an international, is a criminal, a war criminal wanted by the International Criminal Court in The Hague, and it's well, Ambassador, arrest, some, some might say that the problems the have thing. been going on in, your, in the eastern part of your country long before. I mean, Bosco and Taganda is just perhaps the, a, a recent uh, example of problems there, but they've been going on for a long time. Is that not perhaps uh, a sign of a lack of inclusiveness on the part of your government? No, absolutely. I, I, I understand that the problem has been going on for a long time, but 
you must recognize the fact that for the past two years, we have had peace in the East until they mutinied from the National Army and creating the chaos that we know today. Okay, let's uh, bring uh, Chris Berwaltz back into the discussion. And my question is, what is the position of the international community in this? I mean, it's been said that the U.S. and the U.K. have a lot of influence. They give a lot of aid to the region. Um, if they wanted to change things, they probably could. What is their position in this? Um, well, I think that um, very important things happened in 2009 when um, and Rwanda and Congo uh, became, became partners that was not a marriage out of love, but it was one of, um, uh, based on, on interests. And, and the climate between the two countries um, uh, improved a lot. And, and now that's uh, under extreme, uh, extreme um, pressure uh, with, with the high potential of violence. Uh, what I'm seeing from the international community today is that, that people insist on, on, on uh, the maintenance of, of, of that, that re uh, relationship and that, that commitment of non-violent uh, conflict regulation. So, and that's why we see a lot of um, signals and declarations uh, directed towards Rwanda to, n to stop its involvement in, in, in uh, what's happening um, today. All right, let's bring uh, Ambassador James Kimonio back into the discussion. You mentioned earlier that Rwanda does have an interest in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. What is the interest for you? Is it simply stability or is it more than that, as some are suggesting? No, what I was suggesting is that uh, uh, it is a very, very you know, critical issue that is overlooked in this entire discourse. Uh, there is... Uh, FDR, which is uh, uh, an attire of the, uh, uh, comprised of the people who committed genocide in 1994. In the first place, I think the UN troops that were stationed in Eastern Congo was to primarily deal with that. We have had joint operations with the DRC to deal with that. There seems not to be uh, serious measures that are taken to address uh, that problem. Even though the ambassador said they, they, in the last two years, uh, DRC has enjoyed peace and stability in the region, uh, I don't think that's the case because we have had cases of women being raped and, and people being killed and, and, and this whole thing has been done by the FDR. So I think for us, as long as this group is still stationed in the RRC, they are still armed, they are still training, threatening our security, we cannot just close our eyes and say we are peaceful back home and, and these people should continue to their forces. So we have interest, and, and I think, as you know, Rwanda has been a key regional and international partner in seeking peaceful means uh, to, to address the, the, those uh, kinds of situations. Are, are you saying, sir, so that, that perhaps the authorities in the DRC are deliberately turning a blind eye to the existence of groups which are not very favorable to your government? It, it's, very, it's a very complex issue. I think uh, it, it might, it must, in my view, support the uh, initiatives that are being undertaken by, by, by regional government, including the, uh, the International Conference, the Great Rift region that recently uh, came up with a proposal to stabilize the region. I think we should support that process, and, and I think Congo, Congolese government has been part of that. And, and, and I think it should be uh, encouraged to continue uh, being part of the, uh, uh, the peaceful you know, kind of resolution of the situation. So I'm, I'm not saying they have kept blind. I, I think they more, much more complicated than, than, than one uh, would think. So wh what we are, we are calling for as a government of Rwanda is to encourage the regional initiatives to address the, the situation in eastern Congo, politically rather than looking at one isolated case that will not probably end up solving the, the whole problem. All right, let's take uh, perhaps that point back to uh, Ambassador Barnaby. Uh, it has been a long-standing criticism, if not a fact, that in the east of the country, a lot of groups have been operating in your country, uh, and various governments on both sides of the border have used uh, rebel groups against each other. Isn't that a fact, Ambassador? Well, not from the Congo, using a rebel group from, uh, against Rwanda or Burundi or any of our neighbors. The that has never the matter, happened in the history the of the DRC or going back to Zaire that uh, a government in Kinshasa has never used or turned a blind eye to a, a group 
to operate on its soil against any neighboring country? Is that what you're saying? Well, the, pre the presence of the FDLR, the people who committed the, uh, the genocide in 1994 in the Congo, is not they, w they did not come to the Congo invited by the Congolese government. These people are there, but I hope the ambassador knows that there is a standing agreement between the Congo and Rwanda allowing the militaries from both sides to track down these FDLR people. And that's still standing now. And uh, we, we are actually the two armies have done a, an excellent job on that. But I don't know how Rwanda will achieve peace in the region by constantly, since 1998, creating and supporting rebel movements in Eastern Congo, starting with the RCD, going to the Mutebusi Lorankunda, CNDP. Today we hear of uh, the M23. And if you, r you read the report by the group of experts, we see that even some of the various Mai Mai groups are being uh, okay, supported. Okay, since you've made that point, very Rwanda. briefly, could I bring the Ambassador uh, Kimonio back into the, the discussion for a very brief response to that? How do you respond to that, that you're constantly yeah, using groups the like the RCD and so on? Every time there's a problem in Congo, you know, uh, started by anybody, that's the class accusation. Nobody has been able to prove it. For us, we, we believe that once DRC, Eastern DRC, and the entire Congo is peaceful, then we shall be completely peaceful. And we, we, we are working very hard to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, we are stable and our neighbors are stable. So I think, you know, you know, trading the accusation is not going to help the situation, and the ambassador knows very well that we cannot be, on one hand, be working with the Congolese army to try and remove all those forces that destabilize the region, and at the same time create another situation. For, for us, I think it's very unfair to even drag Rwanda into the, the current, current, current crisis. For us, we want, we have been working very hard with the Congolese government and, and, and the army to stabilize the region. We had actually be, gone beyond that point and started talking about uh, uh, economic development within the region. So we cannot, while we, we, we are building peace at home, try to create a, a situation. And as you know, it has impact right. on our own. Right, let me bring Mr. Bunvige back into the discussion. Uh, is there a fear here, to what extent could it be true that this could develop into another huge regional war along the lines of the one that we saw back in 1998? Well, I, I do believe that this will be very unfortunate if it was in a big war. But I do also want to say this. The government in Kinshasa is responsible for what has happened. The government should have taken the measure. They have three years uh, with uh, Bosco Kuntaganda in their hands as a, as a general. They had, they had uh, uh, an opportunity to, uh, to, to enhance the democratic process. But instead of enhancing it, they created one of, one of the biggest election fraud in the, in the Congo. And on top of that, this government has persistently, persistently not been able to bring in good governance in terms of... All right, all right, because we've got a minute left. You, so I'm going to jump in here because we've got one minute left and you made a lot of allegations there. Allow me to bring in Ambassador Barnaby for a response there. He's made some good points. I'd like to hear your response to it. Why did it take so long? You had three years, as he says. You didn't arrest Mr. Bosco. Poor governance, fraudulent elections. Your response to that, sir? Well, once again, where we started, I, uh, w the government of the Congo had to choose between justice and peace. As a matter of fact, for the past three years, since the arrest of Laurent Kunda, who, by the way, was arrested by Rwanda, and he is still in Rwanda, and this is another war criminal. But if you've chosen peace, sir, how would you respond to some of the statistics which say this, for example, 75% exactly. poverty in your country when you own 70% of the world's coltan and 30% of the world's diamonds? Surely there is a governance issue here, isn't there? No, w w the, the country, I mean, we, let's not mix issues. We're talking about one thing. Let's not talk about uh, the democratization of the Congo, the elections in the Congo, poverty in Congo. Congo is not the only country that is poor. Let me respond to what the ambassador of Rwanda was saying. In 1998, they also took the same attitude. We are not in Congo, we are not in Congo, until they were forced to admit. And they admitted, we went to some city and signed an agreement which brought peace to the region. Today, they are taking the same attitude. Right. We're not there. Right. When the whole world, the international community says that you are there, 
and they say they are not there. All right, we are running out of time, so I'm afraid we are going to have to end it here. Let's thank our guests, Ambassador James, Ambassador Barnaby, Chris and you, sir. Thank you all so much for joining us here on Inside Story. And thank you, our viewers, for joining us on this edition of the show. As always, if you want to send us your feedback, you know where to email us. It's InsideStory at AlJazeera.net. Thanks again for watching.